All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A little bit of history. This last week, we celebrated two significant impacts, two significant events in the kingdom of God. Anybody know what they were? What they are? I'll give you a hint. One of them was on Tuesday. How long ago? Is that what you said? Halloween. Halloween, no. No. That was, that's, that's close. It's actually on that day, but it's, that's not, no. That's not it. All Saints Day, yeah, that's kind of it. I'll give you another hint. Wittenberg. Ooh, say that again. Reformation. Reformation. 500 years ago Tuesday, Martin Luther posted on the door of the Wittenberg Church, which by the way, posting it on the door was not a big deal. That was where they put their, that was their bulletin, their bulletin board. But he posted his 95 thesis on the, the door of the Wittenberg Church proclaiming what he saw to be heresies in the Catholic Church, false teachings. I don't believe that, that Luther was in any way thinking that he was going to start the Protestant Reformation. I think Luther was looking at problems that were endemic to the Catholic Church and, and he wanted with all of his heart for the church to fix them. I don't think Luther ever thought of himself as anything other than a Catholic, even though he was excommunicated for this. But 500 years ago, Tuesday, God moved to bring life into His church to correct some of the things that had gone wrong, to, to address the selling of indulgencies. Does anybody know what indulgencies are? Pay enough money and, and you get out of jail free. Okay. So 500 years ago, um, the other one was, I believe, Friday, and that was a 100-year anniversary. Does anybody know what that one was? Does anybody know what the Balfour Declaration is? Mm -hmm. When Britain said that uh, Israel could be its own country. Ooh, 1917, coming out of World War I, Great Britain was jockeying for position with the Ottoman Empire in the, the Middle East, specifically in the area that today is Israel. And the Jews had come to the, the leadership in Britain and said, we want our homeland back. We want you to help us get our homeland back. And so after looking into this, Lord Balfour wrote a declaration on behalf of of the king declaring that it was England's intent, it was Great Britain's intent to make for Israel a homeland again in that land. Starting a series of events in place that were fulfilled 1948 when Israel actually took possession of the land that God promised them. You go, why is this significant? Because if you look at scripture, God is still fulfilling prophecies today. He's not inactive. He's not sitting up on his throne all caught up in the latest Scrabble. Or whatever it is. What are those? Sudoku or whatever. Okay, is that what they are? Okay, whatever. God knows the name. God is working to accomplish His purposes. 100 years ago, He made it so that a great nation an empire would take up the cause of his people that his word would be fulfilled because he said he was going to bring his people back to Israel, the land that he promised them. So keep your eyes open. Things are moving. God is not inactive. If you don't see God moving, it's because you're not looking or you're not looking in the right place. Okay? One of the keys to this, folks, is you've got to pay attention to what's going on over in the Middle East. We get so egocentric in, in looking at what's going on in America. Scripture wasn't written America-centric. It was written Israel-centric. Okay, That's the place, Jerusalem specifically, is the place that God wrote His name and declared it to be His. Okay, So a little history for you. Halloween, 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, what, what we consider to be the birth of 
of the Protestant Reformation, uh, Friday, the, the anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. So there you go. Little tidbits for you. Um, before I get into my message today, I need to preface something. Um, First Timothy chapter four verse thirteen. Go ahead and flip there real quick. Timothy is one of the pastoral epistles, pastoral letters. This is Paul as the, the father figure, the, the leader. Uh, he's sharing insight with Timothy, whom he considers a beloved son, about what what Timothy's job is going to be about, what he needs to look at, what he needs to do, what he needs to be aware of. And I think any man that is called to be a pastor needs to take a deep look at the books of Timothy and Titus. Because both of those young men were, were second generation leaders in the church that came up underneath Paul. And so the letters that he wrote, it's just like God was speaking down through the ages to pastors today. Because the, the, the teaching that he gave them is just as accurate today. So in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. No. Now, does somebody have a different translation that reads that a little bit differently? Does anybody have the NIV or the NASB? Uh, Ken, what do you have? Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of the Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. To preaching and to teaching. Does anybody know what the difference is between preaching and teaching? Did anybody uh, give me kind of a, a, a brief synopsis of what those two are? Nobody? Oh, come on, you know you're thinking them. Don't make me do all the work. Anybody can be a teacher. We all, we're all called to be teachers. We're not all called to preach. Okay. Lord. James, yeah, James says, uh, well, actually, uh, Hebrew says that by this time we should all be teachers. And James, it actually costs us because it says that not many of you should presume to teach because we know that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Okay, preaching is a proclamation or an exhortation. You are just speaking forth something. Teaching is kind of the nitty-gritty where you get in and you take things apart and you put them back together again, seeing how they work. Okay, I, I by nature or inclination or design, I don't know, I, I tend to be more of a teacher and not very much of a preacher. Um, I, I'm not one of these men that is especially gifted with proclaiming or, or exhortation. Um, but this week I was working over my notes for the Passover because that's the next feast that we're going to be talking about in our series and and it's interesting because I've started off with too much information and I'm trying to go through and 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 get to the the nuggets but it's really hard to look for gold in a pile of gold and so for every nugget that I keep I've got to lay some to the side just for the concerns of time um, and I, I, I just I was not having a lot of luck and I was I was Troubled in my spirit. And I, I read some things in some uh, newsletters that I get, some uh, devotions that I do. This recurring theme seemed to keep working up. And, and finally, about Thursday, I, I kind of said, okay, God, what, what's going on here? I've got all my notes. I've done my part. I've done the work. Why am I so unsettled with this? And I felt like he spoke to me. I, I need to... I need today I need to proclaim okay today I'm not going to teach I'm going to proclaim having said that I want to say this I am not in any way thinking of a single person here I don't want anyone to walk away going oh what's he doing why is he picking on me I'm not picking on anybody okay I'm going to give you the word as God gave it to me. Now, if it stings, talk to God. 
Find out why it stinks. Okay? Because a lot of you, I have no idea what's going on in your life. So if this message is for you, then take it. Let it percolate. See what God is doing. Ask Him. Okay? Now, having said that, this proclamation, this message, is not for unbelievers. This message is to the church. This message is to those who proclaim Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay? So, having said that, let's, let's look at some things. The first thing that kicked this off for me was a uh, devotion that I read by Oswald Chambers. I just want to read it to you verbatim, if you would allow me. Um, the, the passage is uh, John 14, 15. says, If you love me, keep my commandments. This is what Oswald Chambers has to say. He says, Our Lord never insists on obedience. He stresses very definitely what we ought to do, but He never forces us to do it. We have to obey Him out of a oneness of spirit with Him. That is why whenever our Lord talked about discipleship, He prefaced it with an if, meaning... You do not need to do this unless you desire to do so. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, Jesus is saying, to be my disciple, let him give up his right to himself, to me. Our Lord is not talking about our eternal position. This is something you need to grasp real quick here. Okay? God is not talking about our eternal position. This isn't about whether or not you're in heaven. Okay? But about be our being of value to Him in this life here and now. That is why He sounds so stern. Never try to make sense from these words by separating them from the one who spoke them. The Lord does not give me rules, but He makes His standard very clear. If my relationship to Him is that of love, I will do what he says without hesitation. If I hesitate, it's because I love someone I have placed in competition with him, namely myself. Jesus Christ will not force me to obey him, but I must. And as soon as I obey him, I fulfill my spiritual destiny. My personal life may be crowded with small, petty happenings, altogether insignificant, but if I obey Jesus Christ in the seemingly random circumstances of life, they become pinholes through which I see the face of God. Then when I stand face to face with God, I will discover that through my obedience, thousands were blessed. When God's redemption brings a human soul to the point of obedience, it always produces. If I obey Jesus Christ, the redemption of God will flow through me to the lives of others because behind the deed of obedience is the reality of Almighty God. <clears throat> that was just one of probably eight, eight or nine things that I read this week that really just kind of kind of got me. Because something that I've been doing uh, as we've been reading uh, in the brothers meeting Every Man's Battle, um, there are some things that they, they bring to light that I believe we as Christians tend to poo-poo and, and brush under the rug. And then <clears throat> as part of that study, I was looking at statistics and, and um, a very scary proposition, uh, a very scary observation started coming to me. Because the statistics show that from the world to the church, there's not a whole lot of difference. What I mean is that if you look at the rate of pornography viewing in America, that rate does not significantly change from outside the church to inside the church. If you look at the, the rate of... Um, sexual affairs or emotional affairs, that rate does not significantly decrease from outside the church to inside the church. You look at the rate of divorce, 
doesn't change significantly from outside the church to inside the church. You look at the rate of addictions, it doesn't change significantly from outside the church to inside the church. So what's the difference? We hide it better. Mm -hmm. See, one of the things that Jesus railed against, that he set himself in cold opposition to, was religion. Now, let, let, let me back up because I want to explain something about religion. You look up the definition of religion. It's going to say something along the lines of adhering to or, or aligning yourself with a belief. Okay, And that in and of itself is not bad. As a matter of fact, if you're aligning yourself with the belief that Jesus Christ is Lord and that there is only one God, He's the maker and sustainer of all things, I, I want to be that kind of religious. I want to align myself. I want to adhere to that line of thinking. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the religious I'm talking to that I, I want to talk about is, is this idea that you pretend to be adhering to those things. Okay? In religion, you work your way to God. In salvation, God's already made His way to you. Okay, so here's the dilemma that I'm having. And this is the thing that, that kind of stuck me this week. We are not unique. Jesus Community Church is not unique. I would be a fool to believe that those same statistics aren't relative in some measure to this body. I would be deceiving myself if I thought that we were immune to those numbers. I would be not doing you justice if I operated under the pretense that everyone in here was okay. See, when God called us he called us to a holiness, a set-apartness. He took us from the common, the mundane, the profane, and He drew us out, and He made us His very own. He made us to be like Him. Okay, now, Imago Dei, we are all created in the image of God. Everybody in this pool of the common is made in the image of God, but sin has corrupted that. Okay? Sin has besmirched that. It's diminished it, such that we often don't see it. But when God draws us out, that whole process of making us to look like Him should, by its very nature, make us different than the common. Now I believe absolutely, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we stand before God absolutely righteous because of the blood of Christ, not because of anything we did, Ephesians chapter 2. So there's nothing we can do, lest any man would boast. Okay, so it's all that God did, nothing of what I did. He brought me out, He cleaned me up, He made me righteous. Okay, but then there's this co-joining of effort called this process of sanctification, where God's Spirit comes and resides in us and it starts to clean house. And there are things, folks, that got to go. Because what does the light have to do with darkness? What does the holy have to do with the profane? What does the righteous have to do with sin? I think we need to do a sharp self-evaluation. Actually, it's not even a self-evaluation. I think we need to have God's Spirit speak to us. I think we need to listen. I think in some ways we have become just like those in the book of Hebrews. We've hardened our ears. We're hard of hearing. I don't like that. I'm going to go to a different verse. I want, I want something that's going to please me. I want something that's going to encourage me. I want something that's going to lift me up. I don't want to have problems. Guess what, folks? We all have problems. 
Scripture says we all stumble in many ways. Okay? And if it left it there, we'd be in trouble. But thanks be to God, His Holy Spirit resides in us. Amen? Amen. So, where are we at? What's going on inside of us? God has called us out of the, the culture in which we live, out of this society, out of this community, and He's made us something unique, something set apart, something different. How are we different than them? One of the biggest things that we've got to battle is that we are so grafted into our culture. We're so knitted into it. It's like, like <coughs> sick. The things that we think and believe that are not biblical. Those things that we choose to take a stand for that God looks at us and says, you're going to stand for that? Really? That? You're going you're gonna to choose to make your stand on that. There is an entire world dying. And you're going to make that your point. That your issue. What is the point? God has called us first to be His children. And as His children, He has given us a mission whereby we don't come in here and celebrate together without that we go out there. Without that we get out into the community, that we take the light that He's given us and we let it shine before all men. Now this leads us to a problem. Because how can you effectively witness to someone when you behave no different than that someone? If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, but it attends church on Sunday, it's okay. That's the mentality we have. Hey man, I was in church, I'm good. Man, I got my gold star. I'm a regular attendee. Not to belittle that by any means, but if it is not influencing you here such that the effect is seen out there, really what difference does it make? What difference does it really make? Listen, folks, if we are going to proclaim His name, if we are going to declare ourselves to be Him, which we ought to be doing, it can't just happen here. It's got to go out there. Folks, we got the cure to the worst cancer it's ever been. Because this is a cancer that takes away your life for eternity. This is a cancer that you stand before your Creator and He says, Depart from me. I never knew you. Some months back, there was a CEO of a pharmaceuticals company that came under a lot of heat for charging exorbitant rates for his medication, something like $1,200 a dose for something that took a matter of a few dollars to make, manufacture. And essentially, he was charging the price because he could. Well, he got into a lot of hot water, and uh, this was a drug that was critical to the needs of the people that were suffering from this disease, and it became a great big hullabaloo. It became, people were offended. People were uh, righteous indignation. How dare he? Why would he not? But are we not doing the same thing? Are we not hoarding for ourselves all that God has done if we don't take it out and give it out to others? Look, folks, when Jesus called us, when He called us in the Scripture says, He says, man, if they hated me, they're going to hate you because you're not above me. It's enough for you to be like me. But if they hated me, they're going to hate you. We're so worried about what the world thinks about us that we don't give a rat's patoot about what God thinks of us. We operate under this, this dome of grace. And thank God for that dome of grace. I would be lost without that dome of grace. But then we take that and we want to invite into that grace our own sin. We don't want to give it up. We don't want to let it go. 
We figure if we can just kind of remove the obvious signs of the sin, then it'll be okay. It's not going to offend anyone. What can you hide from God? Nothing. Nothing. Who's the judge? God is. So, you know, when you come in here and, and you hide the things that are going on in your life and, and whatever is, is going on, whatever you're struggling with, Okay, that might make you feel better in the moment because everybody thinks you're okay. But they're not really thinking that about you, are they? They're thinking that about a, a two-dimensional persona that you presented to them. I remember a while back we had a, a word that was given um, about the masks, these giant masks that we carry around with us. And, and it's like there's this picture of us on the front and we bring it into church and we present it. Hey Gordy, how you doing today? Good to see you, brother. And we present our mask to each and every person because if we put that mask down, they would see us as we really were. Hey folks, God sees you as you really are. And He loves you anyway. And He desperately loves you anyway. <clears throat> and if we are truly going to be the body of Christ, if we are going to operate and function as the body of Christ, as He has called us to be, we're going to have to take the stinky diapers. We're going to have to deal with the mess. We're going to have to help each other out. Now this church, I, I tell you what, there are some areas that this church accelerates better than any church I have ever been in. And I say that to commend you. Whenever there's a need presented in this church, presented once, done, taken care of. There is a generous spirit that lives in this church that I, I find amazing. And I honestly, I believe that's why God blesses this church. Because we don't take it all and say, oh, mine, 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 mine. No, man, as it comes out and God gives us notice, we send it out. We needed 100 dozen cookies made for the outreach last Tuesday. Oh, yeah, we got 100 dozen. And then some. Oh, my Lord, those kids will be eating cookies for a year. <laughs> There's a generous nature to this church that is just amazing. And it goes beyond just, just financial things. Somebody needs some help getting, uh, the, the lackeys needed help getting their wood split. A bunch of the men showed up and they got all of it. You know, they were looking for just some of it to get them through the winter. And those men went out and they cut it and they split it and they stacked it. And it was done. I don't know how many people this church has moved. People that need help getting stuff loaded up, packed up, taken to storage, taken out of storage, put back in the truck, taken from the truck, put to a new house. There's just a, 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 a willingness to step in and help out where need be. What makes me nervous is what I'm not seeing. Because quite honestly, I look at this church and, and I think, wow, what a great church, what a great body of believers. But I'm, I'm, I'm deceiving myself if I don't think you guys struggle with things. If I don't think that there are people in here that, that have sin issues that are controlling their lives that are caught in a trap and they don't know how to get out. And quite honestly, if, if you're caught in a trap, isn't church the place where you come so that people can help you get out? And I know, I know, man, we've all been there. We've all been in churches where somebody, even ourselves, has, has come before someone in a time of need to, to reveal something that was close and sensitive and, and touchy and painful and, and had horrible things happen. The church, instead of acting as the body of Christ, looked an awful lot like the world. Acted an awful lot like our enemy. And, and you know, the, there's a saying that the church is the only army that kills its wounded. And we, we've all seen that. Now, by God, I won't let that happen here. If you cannot be real in this place, I think that is a horrible, horrible judgment against this body. 
If you are afraid to share what's going on in your life, the areas that you're struggling with this body, what does that say about this body? First John tells us that everyone sins. It even says that if we say we don't sin, we're liars. There you go. You just added another sin onto the pile. I sin. I know. You're paying me not to sin. You're paying me to be the example. Guess what? I still get frustrated. I still get irritated. I still want to do things my own way. And there are times I can be downright ugly. I, I have failings. Sometimes I'm completely oblivious to things that I need to pay attention to. I, there's something that may be presented to me and I go, oh, okay, and on about my merry way and all of a sudden I've just missed something huge. I understand we all struggle. But this is the place where we come to get built up, to be, to be set free, to be strengthened, to be equipped. But see folks, it can't just be here. We can't just have a, a fortress mentality where we come together and, and it's just us. And, and you know, there, there are other things out there, but in here we're safe. God didn't call us to be safe. He called us to be in warfare. He called us to battle. When Jesus Christ comes back, where are we going to be? When He comes to, to make things right with this world, where are we going to be? I don't know about you folks, but I'm sitting on a horse behind Him watching Him do it all. But until that time, I have got to be armored. You have got to be armored. You've got to stand and fight. And part of that standing and fighting is dealing with that nature that is at war within you. Galatians chapter 5, that ongoing struggle between the spirit and the flesh. That flesh that wants its own way, own way. And man, it can be powerful. And it can be potent. And it can be deceiving. And it can make the grossest, filthiest, disgusting things look good. And there's that ongoing battle. But see, God did not call us to operate, to function independently. First, He called us to function under the leadership, under the building up of Him. And as part of that, He put us in a body. He put us in a fellowship, this, this corporate entity that Christ reigns and rules over, and we function as whatever He gives us to function as. And if you don't know what your position is in the body, come talk to me. Let's find out where you're gifted. Let's find out where God would place you in this church. I have no idea. I, I'm not, I, man, I'm not thinking of any particular person in this place. Okay? I don't want anybody walking away going, oh, he was bad-mouthing me. Look, folks, I've had to deal with it all week. You guys only have to deal with it for 45 minutes or so. Okay? Where are we at? Are you struggling with sin? Are you hiding sin so that people will think you're okay? Hey, look, the reality of it is if we read Scripture, we all know you're not okay because we're not all okay. All of us are struggling. We're all in this war together. Remember when Moses was standing up on the rock and the battle was going on down below and when he lifted his hands, the Israelites won. And when he dropped his hands, the Israelites lost. And after a period of time, what happened? He couldn't keep his arms up any longer. So what happened? Who? Aaron came on one side and lifted his arm. Joshua came on the other side and lifted his arm. And Israel won. Folks, 
there is no shame in saying you need somebody to come alongside you and lift your heart. The shame is that if anybody would do anything but come and lift your arm, help you, encourage you, strengthen you, exhort if need be. Okay. So I preached. I proclaimed what I felt like God gave me to say. I've told you what God has been speaking to me this week. The ball is in your court. Okay? You guys take with this, and you do what God would lead you to do. You go, you do, just as God would say. But I, I, I tell you what, if you walk back into the hole that you've been hiding, you are stripping from God His power to work through His body. You are removing from this church an opportunity to be blessed by blessing you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you because you are the almighty God. You are El Shaddai. Father, you know all things. You see into the deepest places of my heart. You're aware of things that have not even come to my knowledge and my understanding yet. And yet you love me. And you chose to give up your life in my place. I ask, Father, that you would help us to be a body that would represent you well, that would bless, that would encourage, that would, would bring you pleasure. Strengthen us, Father, for the fight. Give us boldness to, to speak forth your word, to proclaim that which you would have us say, to bring the good news to those who need to hear it, Help us to faithfully plant seed. Help us to water, to nurture, to fertilize. And Father, help us to reap a harvest. We thank you, Father, for all of your grace and all of your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.